Once upon a time, not so long ago, a people who believed themselves to be free fell under an ever-growing shadow of malice and bondage as their world descended into a war without end. And out of the chaos of a wounded world emerged an unassuming figure, a man who sought to construct a universe of strange enchantment, a land which might captivate all who longed for a more innocent past a safe paddock where magic flourished and the echoes of laughter could deafen the sounds of sirens, bombs, and bullets. His kingdom soon stretched to an empire, which encouraged children to never grow up and told adults they never had to leave. Unlike the kingdoms of old, this territory didn't require a dangerous and grueling pilgrimage for a chance to enter its gates. This empire was accessed through the mind. As the decades passed, the nights seemed longer as the looming shadow blanketed generations, societies, and nations. And alongside it, the magical happy kingdom found its way into every television, onto nursery walls, and within classrooms. Most thought nothing of it, and who could blame them? They'd never been outside the paddock, distracted and entertained from birth, the very nature of their reality molded by machinations. But some escaped the paddock, leaving the gate wide open for others to follow, questioning the true intent of such a grand illusion. What exactly were they being distracted from? What were the real reasons adults were being encouraged to stay children forever? And why did one corporation, seemingly organic in origin and claiming purity and motive, seek to dominate every entertainment medium? Chances are we all have the same shared childhood experience of being entertained by Disney at some point or another. So let's get to know the man who started the empire, an empire whose exports have become synonymous with absolute goodness. Walt Disney, the most circulated origin story of the pioneer of cartoons and entertainment aimed at children, is that he was born in 1901 in Illinois to his mother, a grammar school teacher, and his father, a sometimes farmer, occasional businessman, perpetually unsuccessful entrepreneur, and a devout socialist. Though Walt showed artistic promise in his youth and drew cartoons for his high school newspaper, he dropped out of school at age 16 to join the war effort. Being too young to enlist in the army during the First World War, he managed to get a gig as a Red Cross ambulance driver in Paris. And according to Disney historians, Walt spoke only positively of his role in World War I telling his daughter many years later that it was a valuable experience for him and was quoted telling her that, if we have to send our boys into the army, we should send them even younger than we do. After the war, Walt moved to Kansas City to become a newspaper artist, using the connections he built there to pursue a career in film, creating animated commercials for the Kansas City Film Ad Company. In 1922, Walt followed a similar path to his brother Roy in establishing even deeper connections, pursuing an initiated variety of brotherhood and rumored secret wisdom. Walt joined the Demolay, a fraternal organization for young men ages 12 to 21, which was founded in Kansas City and named after the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, a Masonic faction with its documented original purpose of protecting Christian pilgrims on their journey to the Holy Land. Jerusalem. The Templars became a major military power during the Crusades and were reportedly exempt from taxes in nearly all civil laws and authority, but were purged from France during the 1300s after some Templars were tortured and confessed to worshipping idols like the Baphomet and having a little too much male bonding, if you know what I mean. All the idol worship and other extracurriculars have since been denied by the order. And now that I've splashed scalding hot Templar tea across your lap, let's get back to Mr. Mickey Mouse. Shortly after branching out on his own, Walt's new business of live action and animated fairy tales went bankrupt. But that wasn't the end for Walt and his cartoons, of course. After moving to Hollywood in 1923, Walt and his brother Roy formed the Disney Brothers Studio, which has since evolved into the Walt Disney Company we know now. He married one of his artists, Lillian, along the way, fathering one daughter with her and adopting the second. Though for many years, the Disney family went along with the story that Lillian had given birth. These were the early days of Disney's kingdom. Walt's iconic Mickey Mouse character first debuted in 1928, along with his girlfriend Minnie Mouse. After Mickey's success, Walt, his wife Lillian, and brother Roy toured Europe, where they visited the British royal family and political elites. 
That same year, in 1935, Walt was even presented with a medal from the League of Nations, which recognized his character, Mickey, as a symbol of universal goodwill. Back in the United States, Walt's first animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, came during the midst of the Great Depression, with its target audience being children. But not all stories in Walt's life had a fairy tale ending. In 1938, Walt's mother died in an accident at her home in Hollywood. It was a home that Walt and Roy had bought their parents after Snow White's success. Walt's mother complained of problems with a furnace leaking upon moving in, which was reportedly addressed by Walt's studio repairman, but not fixed entirely. Only a few days later, she and her husband were found asphyxiated in their home, though Walt's father survived. A very specific trend emerged in the feature films released after Disney's mother's death. The main characters didn't have a mama. The guilt of Walt's mother's death became the go-to explanation of why so many of the major Disney characters were motherless. But was that really the true reason or convenient excuse? The first leg of Walt's career seemed to be marked by creative desire, glimpses of success, his brother Roy's business choices, personal tragedy, and a propensity towards bankruptcy. But all that changed with the Second World War. Revealed in documents reopened through the Freedom of Information Act, prior to the official beginning of World War II, Walt was recruited by the FBI to spy on Hollywood as a paid asset. Walt even had underlings who reported to him on official spy business. Walt expanded from an individual asset to establishing the Walt Disney Company as a government contractor. In the United States, military parked themselves at Disney Studios only one day after Pearl Harbor. His studios cranked out instructional military films, war bond advertisements, and endless propaganda for the war machine. Mickey played a huge role in World War II, with his likeness painted across aircrafts to lift the spirits of the men fighting. Mickey helped children feel safer during the war, with a line of issued gas masks resembling the face of the mouse, making them seem less threatening. Mickey Mouse was even the password of the Allies for the infamous D-Day invasion of 1944. But was D-Day any less bloody because of a silly password? Was the reality of war any different because of the cartoons painted on the sides of aircrafts? Were children any safer because their gas masks had Mickey Mouse on them? Of course not. But one image managed to invoke specific feelings linked to childhood, altering the perception of all who looked upon it. And that's how this rodent became an emblem of hope, of Americana, and of the middle class. And, well, that's Disney magic for ya. Following World War II, Disney diversified. Yeah, Walt had created a successful company. He'd had some wins along the way. But what transformed his kingdom into an empire was his utilization of television as a medium, becoming a pioneer in the new frontier. 1950 marked the first Disney television broadcast, which proved successful in advertising his new film, Alice in Wonderland. As a result, ABC and Walt struck a deal. In exchange for the development of two network series, Disneyland and the Mickey Mouse Club, ABC agreed to invest in Walt's dream of a utopia, featuring character stories, watered down versions of American history and adventure, which opened in Anaheim, California in 1955. Furthering his television and government resume was a curious collaboration with one of Operation Paperclip's famous transplants, Warner Von Braun, who broadcasted three films about space exploration through the Walt Disney Studios with a goal of creating interest in the United States future space program, which Von Braun later pursued with his NASA career. Walt had established a mecca on the West Coast, but the East Coast was his next conquest, a swamp in Orlando, Florida where the CIA helped him establish what would be known as the happiest place on Earth, Walt Disney World. And with a few lies, false identities, you know, a little of this, a little of that, his dream came to fruition. But tragically, Walt died of lung cancer, probably a result of his 70 cigarettes a day habit, before his kingdom within a swamp opened. As we reflect upon the life and character of Walt Disney, it's clear that his success was directly tied to his ability to captivate young children. He understood the value of an individual's attention, aggressively marketing his utopia to toddlers who grew up to be lifelong fans, adults who wished to revisit his nostalgia machine. To this day, his animated films hold widespread recognition, 
as they function as an allegory on personal identity, teaching children about their relationships to others as well as to society. With the underlying message blanketed in an attractive world of fantasy and adventure. As we look back on Disney's evolution, it's unclear if Walt envisioned what his company would become, or if he was just a frozen popsicle of a vessel that was commandeered post mortem, a Trojan horse by which subversive agendas were unleashed in the most unexpected of places. On the walls of nurseries are mothers and fathers so lovingly decorated. Within the safety of our living rooms, while we were parked on the couch on Saturday mornings, and even in the confines of public school classrooms, when we were learning about the history of the world. Yes, I know this is the part of the video where I'm supposed to focus on hidden symbolism and Easter eggs that popped up through the animation process, the 666 that is hidden within Walt Disney's logo, the sexual images within Disney posters, and the perverted suggestions and undertones that are not appropriate for the target audience. And sure, we could discuss what goes on underground in the tunnel network below Disney that is less than innocent in nature, the deaths that have occurred and been covered up at the Disney parks, and even the overt Masonic influence at Disneyland like the members only exclusive Club 33, the number 33 seemingly in reference to the number of degrees of Freemasonry, and the floor of the restaurant sporting the Masonic black and white checkerboard, representing the ultimate dichotomy, the good and evil of human life. The same checkered floor rumored to have paved Solomon's temple, of which the toolbox of one of the original builders can be seen at Disney's Jungle River. Look, we could spend forever traveling down the numerous rabbit holes, chasing an endless trail of breadcrumbs, and that's all fine and good. I'm not knocking it, but you know, they spray the wheat fields with Monsanto Roundup to function as a desiccant. So we're going gluten-free for this video because the breadcrumbs always lead to the same place. Somewhere along the way, after our eyes are bloodshot from identifying all of the penises in the backgrounds of Disney posters, we're going to conclude that we need to purge our lives of all that is Disney in one massive internet friends bonfire, during which we drink one too many kombuchas to counteract the effects of gluten and promote healthy gut bacteria. And then, the next thing you know, I throw a bottle of hairspray into the fire, vow to exit society and join an Amish compound, but sell everyone on the idea that it won't be so bad. Because Jethro makes a mean rocking chair, nearly 500 a day, and his physique reflects a lifetime of manual labor, and thanks for listening to my TED talk. Now let's get to the point. It was after Walt's death that the Walt Disney Company began to establish itself not only as a teaching machine for developing young minds, but as a prolific worldwide distributor of entertainment resulting in what the Walt Disney Company is today, a global cultural force. The Disney of today is an unchecked global monopoly, slithering by uncriticized because of its unrelenting campaign to produce a wholesome image. Since Disney is synonymous with childhood virtue, mom and dad think it's more than okay to leave their toddler alone in the room with perhaps the most rogue babysitter the world has ever seen. This mega corporation realized long ago the potential of children, understanding that one day, those children would be adults like me and you. They got their emotional hooks in us when we were young, commandeering our hopes and shaping our interests with images on a screen. Our values, our relationships, and how we see the world, all literally programmed into us with the programming we consumed. Don't believe me? Well, I got receipts. Remember the Mickey Mouse Club? Who emerged out of that pop culture factory? Major American pop culture icons like Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, and Justin Timberlake. And what was the next phase of the Mickey Mouse Club? Non-stop, around-the-clock Disney programming featuring seemingly organic, fresh faces. Do you remember the absolute sensation that was Hannah Montana? Who started that? What's she up to now? We grew up watching these people, attempting to emulate them because we were too young to know ourselves. Don't get me wrong, parents hold a great deal of responsibility over their child's indoctrination. But screen time being part of life is heavily marketed to parents as something that is normal. In 2009, it was reported that children ages 2 to 5 watch TV for an average of more than 32 hours per week. That's like a full-time job of watching TV. But of course, the way we consume our entertainment has drastically changed over the last 10 years. In 2018, 98% of homes with children had a mobile device like a tablet or a smartphone, and 42% of children had their own personal device, meaning more opportunities for megacorporations to monetize childhood, and certainly more chances for Disney to educate children on what it means to be men and women, or even now, what it means to be straight or gay. 
If children are getting hours of screen time every day between getting home from school and going to bed, how much time do you reckon that leaves for parents to engage in meaningful conversation with their children? After these parents get home from a job where they're overworked and underpaid, on average, parents get way more screen time than their offspring. But when they sit down in front of a black box to be entertained, how many of them realize they're consuming the same entertainment as their children? Want to catch a football game on ESPN? Disney. A true crime episode on A&E? Disney. Pawn Stars on the History Channel? Disney. A new Star Wars movie with a feminist agenda? Disney. The latest Avengers installment centered around the theme of depopulation? Disney. Turn off the television and open up YouTube to watch your favorite alternative media personality? Well, they might be Disney too. Within the last year, Disney has purchased the TV and film assets of 21st Century Fox to the tune of $71.3 billion, meaning the handful of mega corporations that controlled our media just got smaller. Welcome to the illusion of choice in the land of the free, where the only way out is seeing through the magic, bearing witness to the reality that is before us. Something strange is happening with Disney and has been for some time. Thank you so much for watching, internet friends. You know I always look forward to your comments. Thank you so much for subscribing, hitting the notification bell, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye.